Hey everyone, this is Patrick Donahoe. Welcome to the Well Standard Podcast. Hope you guys are enjoying the first uh, couple of episodes revolving around uh, the topic of capitalism. And I have, I would say, the, the for, maybe the foremost expert, more foremost living expert on uh, capitalism, uh, Yaron Brook. And Yaron is uh, the, an Israeli-American entrepreneur, writer, activist. He is an objectivist, which we're going to most likely uh, talk about today and what that means. And uh, also is the current chairman of the board at the Ayn Rand Institute. And uh, he also is uh, the co-founder of BH Equity Research and is the author of several books. Uh, the most recent one that has come out is called Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality. So, Yaron, thank you for joining us today. It's uh, awesome to have you on camera, too. Uh, oh, but welcome great. to the show. Yeah, it's great to be here. Looking forward to this. So, Yaron, I find your, your background uh, fascinating and how you came to understand what you do and why you have such a strong belief in your philosophy and in your principles. Would you mind just taking a moment and in, in, informing the listeners of, you know, how, what is your background? How did you come to understand uh, objectivism uh, as well as uh, capitalism? And because uh, which is, you know, I, I would say a very, very strong opinion if, if those uh, that are listening have have listened to you or watched you uh, uh, before. Yeah. And if they haven't, you know, there's, there's tons of videos. Just Google my name and you'll, you'll find a ton of content. Um, you know, I was born and raised in Israel and I was born and raised in Israel in a period of, of time when pretty much everybody was a socialist. I mean, it was just. Yeah, it was just a thing to be. It, the, the, the Labor Party in Israel had won every single election uh, until 1977. And, and uh, it, it was, you just were never exposed to any ideas other than the ideas of socialism. And, and in, in 1977, as it happens, I was 16 years old and, and a friend of mine, I was getting together with a friend of mine, we were talking and he was spouting these kind of free market capitalist ideas. And I looked at him and I said, you know, where are you getting this nonsense from? Where, where, you know, what happened to you? And he said, you got to read this book. And he handed me a copy of Atlas Shrugged. And uh, Atlas Shrugged, for those of you who haven't read it, big, thick book. But I, you know, I read a lot in those days and I, I delved right into it. And it really blew, blew my mind. It, it completely shook my world. It challenged everything I believed in, everything from the very fundamental beliefs I had about ethics and about the purpose of life and about happiness and about morality, and then, of course, uh, about politics and about economics, about everything. And I, I argued with the book. I, I, I didn't want to believe it. I threw it against the wall. I yelled at Ayn Rand. She wasn't there. Um, but by the end of the book, I, you know, I was convinced. And, and it, it, it completely made sense to me. It was completely logical. I thought I completely understood it. Of course, I was still quite ignorant, and I didn't know it. But, but I'd gotten the basics. And it was the beginning of, a, if you will, a lifelong journey of discovering Ayn Rand's philosophy, the philosophy of objectivism, and you know, her view of capitalism, how capitalism fits in to that. I'm, I uh, ultimately became a finance professor, so my interest is more on the politics and economics. But, but it's all grounded in this view of morality, which I think is key to understanding her philosophy and understanding capitalism. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've now studied her philosophy, I've studied economics, I've studied the great capitalist economists. And the more I study, the more I'm convinced that, you know, uh, the, the revolution that went through my mind at age 16 was a true one. And the rest of the world needs to catch up. Uh, what are they waiting for? And it's, it's interesting that your, your perspective continues to be reinforced, it sounds, uh, by doing debates, by, by art arguing, debating, maybe not arguing is the best word, but debating the, the opposite principles. I mean, obviously you experienced it in your childhood growing up, but also, you know, you, you continually challenge uh, both sides of the, of the argument, which I think is profound. It just continues to re reinforce it. So I guess the, the question I'd have for you is, you know, how, how have you come to understand capitalism, you know, to, in, right now? Like when you, when you acknowledge that word and when you look at its, its, its relevance in society and in life, like what, what, is, what is it that is, uh, that's most compelling and, and most profound? So to me, capitalism is freedom. Capitalism is about freedom. It's about the, the freedom of the individual to pursue his values as he sees fit without anybody intervening, where the role of the government is to protect that freedom. You know, the founders called it individual rights. John Locke, you talked about John Locke uh, last season doing a session on John Locke. 
John Locke called it individual rights, and, and they were right. These are the in, individual rights are the freedoms of action. Freedom of action is to pursue the values necessary for your survival, the rational values that you need. And capitalism at the end of the day is a social economic system, political system, in which the government does nothing but protect individual rights, primarily property rights, and where all property is privately owned. So the government has, think about it another way, complete separation of state from economics. Pure capitalism is where the government has no economic role. There's no treasury secretary. There's no regular agencies. There's no federal reserve. There's no role for government in the, in, in when we get together, what we decide, how we decide to exchange, what we decide to exchange, how we decide to produce, how we deploy our resources is completely left to individuals. And as long as I am not committing fraud, as long as I am not uh, punching you in the face, as long as I'm not committing a, a, a crime, as long as I'm not violating your rights, the government has no business intervening in the transaction between us. Now, the, the primary argument, and I want, want you to address this now, is, is that you know, humans, and this is the primary argument that I, that I think we all see in society, is that you know, mankind isn't going to do the right thing. They're going to exploit people. They're going to cheat. Uh, they're going to steal. Uh, they're you know, inherently evil, right? And, and so looking at capitalism, doesn't that just accentuate or magnify those, you know, those flaws of, uh, of, of humankind? Well, even on its own terms, right? So let's assume all men are evil and they're scheming and they're going to screw each other. Okay, so let's take a small group of men, call them saints, and have them control everything. Right? They're the bureaucrats, the politicians. We know that they're saints, right? We know our politicians are complete saints. Now, that is insane. So even on its own terms, it's insane. But the fact is that, that there's nothing to suggest in history that this is indeed the case. Look at us today. Since the, since the invention of capitalism about 250 years ago, um, since the founding of this country, which is about the same time as capitalism comes together, not an accident that the two happened at about the same time, since then, life expectancy has more than doubled. Uh, we're, we're wealthier beyond the most fantastic dreams of anybody living 250, 300 years ago. Nobody could have imagined an iPhone. The fact that we'd be video conferencing right now. Uh, you know, all the tools that are available to us, they barely could imagine. I don't think they imagine automobiles, maybe flying machines that turned out to be nothing like, you know, the, 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 the jets that we have today. So... So if you look at what human beings are capable of doing, of what when they're left free they produce, of how much benevolence and, and help and, and cooperation. Think about capitalism. People think about capitalism, think about competition and cut, cutthroat competition. But the fact is that 99% of capitalism is about cooperation. It's about me hiring you, and that's a cooperative effort. It's about even competitors. You know that um, Apple uses Samsung products in its iPhone, even though it competes with Samsung. I, you know, some of the components in the iPhone are made by Samsung. So even as they're competing, they are cooperating. They're collaborating, yeah. Yeah, so collaboration, cooperation is the essential characteristic of capitalism. And you see that on a massive scale and, and versus every other regime. Like, look at Venezuela socialism, right? Theft, cheating, backstabbing, manipulating. And of course, people say, no, 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 this isn't socialism because they're doing, it's really just a kleptocracy. But that's exactly what socialism is. We can get to that if you want. It is a kleptocracy. But every single regime that's not capitalist, even today in America, I would argue that our politicians are more corrupt today than they were 150 years ago when we were freer. I would argue that people generally in the culture are less honest. People generally in the culture will cut more corners because government is intervening more. I, I think it's exactly the opposite. The freer you allow people to be, people are essentially, people are neither good or bad, but people have it within them to be good. And when the, when the right incentives are provided, when they're left free, when they can benefit when they can reap the rewards of their own action, 
they tend to be good. When you try to control them, when you put mother government on their shoulder to try to tell them what they can and cannot do, they will cut corners, they will cheat, they will. So, I, I mean, I, I truly believe people are neither born, neither good or bad, but goodness is a potential in all of us. And that capitalism brings out the best in people, the most, the, the innovation, the, the hard work, the, the striving to improve their lives and the, the value creation that of course benefits all of our neighbors and everybody, everybody around us. Hey listeners, thanks for tuning in. My book, the Amazon bestseller, Heads I Win, Tales You Lose, a financial strategy to reignite the American dream is completely changing the way people look at saving, wealth, and retirement. Want a sneak peek? Head on over to www.headsortailsiwin.com forward slash podcast for a free audio and text download of my favorite chapter. Again, that's headsortailsiwin.com forward slash podcast. As you, as you debate the opposite opinion, right? Because I, 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 I believe there's a clear distinction of how humans behave within uh, a, a, a environment that's free, an uh, environment that has laissez-faire hands off, uh, and, and one that is centrally planned and, and influenced to take care of the, 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 the well-being of all. Uh, like, what is, it, what is it about the idea of freedom that really drives so much disdain uh, amongst people, especially in, in our very you know, quickly changing uh, liberal perspective on, on things? Well, I hate to give them the compliment of calling them liberals. Liberals used to be a, a good word. Free, it's because yeah. the word you know, basically free. <laughs> but yes, um, I, I think what really drives it is that, look, capitalism demands something of all of us. It demands the best of us. It demands personal responsibility, but not just personal responsibility in the way a lot of conservatives deem it in a kind of shallow sense. No, personal responsibility goes deep down on all of our choices. It demands that we actually pursue a life worth living. Capitalism implies a particular moral code. It implies a moral code of self-interest. Capitalism basically says, you're on your own. Go make the best of your life. Nobody's going to be responsible for you. Nobody's going to take care of you. You need to take care of yourself. And it, and it basically encourages that. So we reward success. We penalize failure. We, we reward accomplishment. So we encourage and promote and, and allow for self-interest. Now, we all know what our mothers taught us about self-interest, about egoism, or about even selfishness, right? Bad things. Bad people are selfish. Bad people are self-interested. But is that really the case? Is when Steve Jobs pursues his self-interest in making the iPhone, and he's clearly pursuing his self-interest, trying to make a lot of money and building a product he loves. Is that a bad thing? Is that hurtful to anybody else? No. Um, when, when, when great scientists, they, they pursue with passion the discoveries that they make, that's not about sacrificing for the world. They're doing it because they love doing it. They do it uh, to, to satisfy themselves. Capitalism is about satisfying uh, own um, uh, rational values, or our, own, our own rational needs. And as such, it goes against the moral code that almost everybody teaches. And this is why I think on the right, among conservatives and among, among people on the right, they have such a hard time defending capitalism, particularly as, a, as an absolute. Hey, we need a little bit of capitalism, they'll tell us, right? No, no, no. We need capitalism, period. We need a complete, absolute capitalism. Because they're uncomfortable with the idea of self-interest, they're uncomfortable with the idea of, of defending and promoting egoism. We have been taught since we were this big that what's good is to be selfless. What's good is to sacrifice. What's noble is to think of others first. And Ayn Rand, this is what blew me away in Atlas Shrugged. She asks a very simple question. She asks, why? Why is your happiness less important than other people's happiness? Why isn't your happiness the most important thing to you? And if you understand how you get happiness, it doesn't, it doesn't come by exploiting other people. It comes by creating values. But 
why is your life less important than other people's life? Why should you live for the other rather than live for yourself? So to me, the real essence of capitalism is a morality of self-interest. And that's what the left, but also the right, find so disdainful. And why the left condemns capital, capitalism, why the right, for the most part, cannot defend it or defend it so poorly. So if you look at, because these, are, these ideas are, are very old ideas. And, I, and I, I look back to, you know, and I haven't revisited this in, in, in a while in detail, but, you know, Adam Smith, before he you know, wrote The Wealth of Nations, wrote the you know, theory of moral sentiments. And, and this was a, you know, and I know, so what's yeah. your, as he talked about, you know, how we're dri driven as, a, as a, a human being, where we do have this, we do have this self-interest, right, to, you know, to, to I would say it starts with like making sure that we stay alive, like we feed ourselves and we clothe ourselves and we, you know, fit into society. But then it gets to the point where, you know, we're driven to make, uh, you know, contribution do, and do things. And ultimately, by pursuing that, you provide for the well-being of, of others as, as a result. So the intention of the left, I would say, by, you know, forcing people right, to give up money or to do this so that they can, you know, distribute to, to, uh, to everyone, you know, it, ultimately the best thing for everyone comes about by a person pursuing that, that self-interest. What are your thoughts around that? Well, absolutely. But, but this is the revolution. This is why Ayn Rand is such a revolutionary, because she fundamentally disagrees with Adam Smith in this sense. Mm -hmm. Adam Smith correctly observed in, in, in the Wealth of Nations and in, in Theory of Moral, Sen Moral Sentiments, he correctly observes that the baker doesn't bake the bread for you. He baked the breads for himself. He, he, hopefully he likes baking bread. More importantly, in the context of the baker, he's trying to make a living. He's trying to feed his family. He's trying to feed himself. He's motivated by self-interest. Adam Smith says, self-interest is not very good. It's not a moral trait. It's not a virtue. But we tolerate it because if you add up the self-interest of all these people, you get a better social outcome. Ayn Rand in a says, says, I don't care about the social outcome. What I care about is your right as an individual to pursue your happiness, mm -hmm. your self-interest. What I care about the baker, I care about the baker is the baker, not what he does to other people, but the baker. And I want the baker to be able to be happy. And for the baker to be able to be happy, he must be free, free to make his own choices, free to have his own ideas, free to bake whatever bread he wants to make, whether it fits into the regulatory regime or not. Free to, as long as his customers want it, and as long as it doesn't, you know, hurt them in a, in a you know, they commits fraud or, or he's putting poison in the bread, he should be able to be free to make his bread as he sees fit and pay his employees as much as he wants because I care about the baker. Now, yes, it turns out that if you leave people free, if you leave people free to pursue their self-interest, society, in, if, if, if you can even define that term, is better off. Everybody who's willing to work, everybody who's willing to produce is better off. But that is not the reason to defend capitalism. The reason to defend capitalism is in a sense what the founders wrote in the Declaration of Independence. You have an inalienable right to pursue your own happiness, your happiness, not society's, your own. And the only political, economic, social system that, are, that leaves individuals free to pursue their own happiness is capitalism. So to me, that's the moral foundation. It's about the individual. And yes, it works because when you leave people free, they take care of their own property. That's why capitalism also produces the cleanest environment. Uh, if you leave, because private property is clean, it's public property that's polluted. When, when the wall came down in Berlin, what we discovered was that the most filthy place on the planet was communist East Europe. Mm -hmm because everything was public property and nobody cared. Everything, everything dumped their garbage in the public space. When you have your own private property, we take care of it. You take care of yourself. You, you then, in order to make a living, you have to produce values that other people want and therefore you are helping them. So when I, when I buy an iPhone, right, for a thousand bucks, it's hard to believe it's that much. My life is better for that. My iPhone is actually worth it don't tell Apple, much more than a thousand bucks, tens of thousands of dollars, this enhances my life. I'm willing to give up a thousand dollars because my life is better off by doing so. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that, every transaction we go through every day, when we buy groceries, when we go to a restaurant, when we buy you know, iPhones, when we consume electricity, whatever it is that we do, 
We are benefiting more than what we're paying. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. So capitalism is a system through trade, through the win-win relationships that trade creates. Capitalism is a system that everybody is constantly better off through it, as long as you're working and, and, and producing something and earning something. So it's a win-win relationships. It, it's a win-win relationship. So because I'm selfish, because I want to produce, because I want to have a better life, I'm making everybody else's life better as well because I have to trade with them. That, that's the beauty of capitalism. And that's the, the beauty of this morality or, or this moral defense of capitalism. So, how, so I, I had a question, and I, I think I knocked you off course with the, the Adam Smith thing. But you, you had gone down and, and talked about this, this notion of, of happiness and, and achievement. And I think you've, it may be in a video that you've, that you've done, but you talked about you know, how people pursue achievement and achievement, achievement gives them a, a, a notion of, of self-worth or confidence uh, and, and that happiness. Do, do you, would you define happiness another, another way or is it in line with, with that, that sequence? No, I think happiness is the, the, the sense you get about life that comes from achieving your goals, yeah. achieving your values, as long as those values are rational, right? I don't think somebody who has irrational values um, can be happy. So if, you're, if your value is to bring about socialism, you're not going to be happy. You're going to be miserable because, because the existential reality of those values is going to be detrimental to your life. So the values have to be rational pro-life values. Happiness comes from achieving those values. Ayn Rand defined happiness as a state of non-contradictory joy. It's when you, you, you just have this positive sense about the world. Nothing is contradicting it. Nothing is fighting it. The world is good. It doesn't mean you don't have problems. It doesn't mean you can't be sad. It doesn't mean tragedies don't happen to you and, and you could be depressed for a while. But overall, your attitude towards your life, your, 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 your standing order in terms of life is... Life is good. Hey, I, can, I achieve stuff. I, I, can, I can make my goals. I can get to the, the you know, achieve my values. And, and that's what happiness. So I think people sitting at home, for example, I think one of the great tragedies of the welfare state is that it basically prevents people who receive welfare from ever being happy. It robs them. It robs them of the opportunity. Robs them of opportunity to be happy because without work, at whatever level you are capable of, without the challenge, without building, creating, making something, at whatever level you can do it, I don't think you can be happy. You have to be able to achieve values. And if you're sitting home playing video games and collecting a welfare check, that's out the window for you. And to me, the welfare state is immoral to a large extent because of that. I, I, I thought about that a lot. And I thought about you know, just with, with people and what they achieve. And, you know, and oftentimes that comes as a result of, of hardship and, and, uh, and, you know, error or mistakes in certain areas and their ability to overcome that and learn and achieve because of it. There's, I don't think there's anything that, that, you know, can, can replace, can replace that. And I look at a, you know, a, a more a free society and how that allows for those opportunities. And, and as you said, it really does, allow people to understand what they're capable, what they're capable of. And I'm not sure if there's another way to do that. I don't think there is. Well, it's at the end of the day, you go down to freedom. You, you have to have the freedom to try. You have to have the freedom to experiment. You have to have the freedom to fail, but you also have to have the freedom to succeed and to benefit from that success so that all, everything else is motivated. And that's what capitalism provides. Capitalism is just, again, the system that leaves you free to do all those things. And that's how you get great innovation. People try stuff out. They come up with crazy ideas. Everybody around them, I'm sure, said, that's nuts. You're insane. Nobody can do that. And then they go do it. And sometimes those crazy ideas turn out to be crazy and they fail. But sometimes, and, and, and maybe less frequently, they turn out to be brilliant and they turn out to be what changes the world. And and under socialism, you don't have that. Under socialism or under any political system, any political system where the state is involved, you basically have to get permission in order to innovate. You have to get permission. And if you take any great idea in human history and you put it in front of a committee, it's going to fail, right? Is the world, go is, is earth going around the sun or is the sun going around the earth? The committee of the Catholic Church decided, no, 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 it's the sun goes around the earth, Galileo, you're all wrong, right? And of course, they shut him up and they, and they, they imprisoned him or they put him in house arrest so he could not articulate this, this, this fallacy. 
in a free society, Galileo would be out there, hey, I just made this incredible discovery. And, and the speed of which science would have developed after that would have been so much faster. We would be so much richer today. But no, everything got slowed down because the committee couldn't decide if this was a good idea or a bad idea. And I think if, if imagine, I always ask, uh, always ask my audiences, imagine if this was designed by a government committee. What would this look like? You know, you don't need to even get the answer. You know what's going on inside of people's heads. They can see some months monstrous machine that's too big and doesn't work and is a disaster. And, but nobody, Steve Jobs didn't need to get permission. He didn't ask anybody. He just mm -hmm. did it. Yeah. I think there it's, it's stifling. You know, and I think it's interesting what's going on in our you know, country today with, you know, the, uh, the, you know, government, government shutdown and 800,000 people not working, you know, but it, it's, it's one of those things. What's that? Permanent. I mean, I would love to see the federal government fire, tomorrow, 800,000 people. I think we as a country would be richer. We as a country would be safer. We as a country would be, would be far more capitalist and far more innovative if we just got rid of these bureaucrats. I mean, I, my only concern about the government shutdown is these people are going to get back pay. I mean, I would like to see them fired. I, I, I would like to see the government shrink by like 80%. You could probably get rid of 80% of government officials keep the military, keep a few policemen and get rid of everybody else. What do we need them for? They only constrain our lives. They only hinder our lives. They don't add anything to it. Hey, listeners, thanks for tuning in. My book, the Amazon bestseller, Heads I Win, Tales You Lose, a financial strategy to reignite the American dream is completely changing the way people look at saving, wealth, and retirement. Want a sneak peek? Head on over to www.headsortailsiwin.com forward slash podcast for a free audio and text download of my favorite chapter. Again, that's headsortailsiwin.com forward slash podcast. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, last week I was, uh, have you been to CES before in Vegas? No, right? I've actually been. I read about it all the time. It's, yeah. It sounds like a great time to it's be. It's cool. Yeah. It's, it's one of those just, you know, it's, it's, it's this whole, this whole topic, you know, you, you experience the results of this, uh, this topic. But I, I was talking, I was in line doing like a demo for the, the self-driving cars. And I was talking to the, the head analyst at Intel, who's creating kind of like the, you know, the technological framework for that. And yeah, the, the biggest impediment was, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was government. He was approving this and approving this. And, you know, it's one of those things where it's, it can stifle uh, in innovation at that level, but it also stifles it at, at lower levels that we've discussed as well, primarily the welfare, welfare state, how we're robbing individuals of just an awesome experience to figure out uh, their life and to figure out how to uh, overcome challenges and problems and get employed. I mean, it's, there, there's so much, in human, a human's mind and their ability to create and, and prosper. And it's just, it is, it's, ro it's robbed from them over and over again. And it becomes a habit and that just, just, it destroys human life. It's, it, I would consider one of the more, uh, you know, biggest tragedies of our, of our day and age. I, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. And, and it, it robs, it robs us from their productive capacity and it robs us, it robs them from their productive capacity and it robs us from their ideas. I mean, just because they weren't off, it doesn't mean if they weren't, with the right incentives, if they if they wouldn't be the next uh, you know the next innovator, the next entrepreneur, the next somebody who created something really important, but we we rob them when they're children. We rob them, but but think about the other great tragedy. Under capitalism, education would be private, and education would be competitive, and education would have to be good. Otherwise, I wouldn't send my kids there. But today, we have a rotten educational system through and through, particularly if you're poor. We have an awful educational system that cripples these kids, doesn't give them the tools, it cripples them. And, and again, this is socialism in practice. We have socialism in education. And what is the result? Worse than mediocrity, it's, it's pathetic, awful. Imagine if education was competitive, if entrepreneurs, instead of thinking of the next app for the iPhone, thought about the next educational product, the next school that they could create, the next chain of schools that they could build, where they would drive prices down and drive quality up. Imagine if we saw billboards with our school, if your son you know, is inclined towards math, our school is great for him, or your son likes to, or daughter likes to paint, you know, 
our school is great for you. And, and here's for, you know, female science, future scientists. And they compete on those things and they market and they advertise. That would be a capitalist world. That would be a worthwhile world. What we're taking is sheer human potential and destroying it by grinding it through a government educational system. And hey, I won't even send a letter through the post. I'd rather use UPS and FedEx. Why would I send my kid to the equivalent of the post office, which is what government education is? Well, yeah, last, so we, you know, I was telling you before we started recording that, you know, last year we focused on uh, John Locke, Life, Liberty, and Property, and how, you know, what those principles were. And one of the guests was, uh, he wrote the book, uh, Free to Learn. His name escapes me right now. Uh, but he, you know, talked about the Sudbury School, Sudbury School System and how, you know, kids are, kids like are, are creative. They're naturally curious about life. And you rob them of that experience by, you know, the shoving curriculum down, down their, down their throat yeah, and, and expect them to be, be creative and like it. Yeah. And I think about competition is we discover which educational system is best, right? There would be competition and, and parents might disagree and there might be all kinds of schools and, mm -hmm. and we would all have different preferences and some would be more successful than others. And it would be innovative and, and, and we would go through the market process of discovery, which educational system was best, just like in any other field, we figure out what's best through competitive markets. And it, the fact that we deny this of our kids and we deny this of our, of, of our society and our culture is tragic, truly yeah. tragic. So let's, let's do this. We could probably go on and on and on with all, because there, there's so much to talk about because there's so much application to, to, human, to human life and the, you know, our, our experience on earth. Uh, but let's, let's end with this. Like, as you've researched this and debated this and thought about this to the, you know, the nth degree, what, what would you say are the most compelling reasons at, a, at a, maybe an individual level to embrace the, the principles of capitalism? Well, I think the most, the most compelling reason is that you value your own life, that, that you want to be free, you want to have opportunities, you want to pursue your own dreams, you, you want to be happy. Um, I, I can tell you it's, it's, it's very difficult to be happy under, com, under socialism, certainly under communism or fascism or statism of any form. Uh, I think the most compelling reason to want capitalism is to, is to want to live it's to, it's, to, it's to want to go out there and produce and create and build and make stuff. And, and it's not even about the money, although money is nice and, and money comes with all that creation. But it's about the sheer fun and enjoyment of pursuing something that you love doing and doing something that you love doing and, and, and making a difference in your own life and challenging yourself and setting ambitious goals and achieving those goals. And it's living. It's, yeah. it's, and, and I think capitalism is the only system that really allows you to do that fully. And, and one of the great tragedies in America today, unfortunately, we think of America today as capitalist, and we're not. We're this mm -hmm. mixed economy with some capitalism still, some freedom, and a lot of regulation and control and, and fascist socialist kind of structures imposed on us. And if we could only get just rid of that, and you know, we could really get richer, get happier, you know, flourish in, in, a, in dimensions we can't even imagine. Everything becomes better with, with, with freedom. Uh, the arts get better, our spiritual life gets better, and our material life suddenly gets better. Well, Yaron, this has been a, a fascinating discussion. And there's, like you mentioned in the beginning, if you Google your name, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff out there. So, what, but why don't you just maybe cover the best ways to follow you, best ways to learn about the Ayn Rand Institute uh, and learn more about, about capitalism? Well, sure. First, I'd recommend everybody read Alice Shrugged and The Fountainhead, Ayn Rand's books. I mean, they're kind of American classics. Everybody should be reading them anyway. So go, go pick up a copy and, and they're available in every format known to man. So, so no excuses. A lot of people, are, a lot of people are listening to the to them these days, right? So just get get the downloaded on Audible and and take a road trip. Um, you can find about Ayn Rand in AynRand.org, a y n r a n d dot org. There's a ton of content, a ton of material there. If you want to study objectivism deeper, there are lots of videos and audio and podcasts and you know just many many years worth of content that's available. Some of it Ayn Rand herself, some of it some of her leading philosophical students who really know her ideas and study them. Uh, to follow me, I, I, the number of ways, the easiest is probably to go on YouTube and to subscribe to my YouTube channel. There's, you know, again, 
thousands of videos uh, up on, on YouTube of mine, and I constantly are producing more. I do a video show at least once a week, usually three, four times a week. So there's, there's a ton of content being produced constantly. And you can do the regular follow me on Twitter and follow me on Facebook. And, um, and I do have a website, uronbrookshow.com. And as far as your books are concerned, can, are they all available on Amazon or on your, on your website? Yeah, I mean, they're all available on, on, on Amazon. They're all available, again, in every format uh, that is available. Uh, I have three books. One is called um, Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government or Can Bring Us Capitalism. The second one is Equal is Unfair. And the third one is The Mall Defense of Finance. So it's a, it's a book about the financial industry and why it's a noble, productive, virtuous, moral industry. So that'll shock a few people. Uh, and uh, <laughs> as a companion to that, I do on YouTube have a talk called The Morality of Finance, which I, I recommend. Well, Yaron, it's been a pleasure. It certainly has. Uh, thank you again for, for your time. And, uh, and yeah, everyone out there, you know, hopefully this has struck a, a few chords and got you to think about capitalism, the principles of capitalism, the principles of freedom at a deeper level. Thanks, Patrick. <laughs>